where Taysom Hill was at his best and worst up against the Dallas Cowboys, how the New Orleans Saints defense limited the number one offense in the NFL, and how the NFL's dropping salary cap last offseason has impacted the Saints and what it means moving into next season. We got all that and a little bit of land yet for you on today's episode of Locked on Saints. You are Locked on Saints, your daily New Orleans Saints podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. What is good, Who Dat Nation and Who Dat Family? Welcome into another episode of Locked On Saints, your daily podcast covering the New Orleans Saints, part of Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. As always, thank you so much for making Locked On Saints your first listen of the day every day. Don't forget, we're free and available on all platforms, including on YouTube as well. I'm your host, Ross Jackson, at Ross Jackson Nola on Twitter, Canal Street Chronicles, Locked On NFL, and of course, here with you every single Monday through Friday, and then some sometimes on Locked On Saints. And today's episode of Locked on Saints is brought to you by On Location, the official hospitality partner of the NFL and the only place that you can score a once in a lifetime Super Bowl ticket and entertainment experience package. Visit onlocationexp.com slash SB56 for more information or search Super Bowl on location. So today is our Film Watch Wednesday here on the show. We're going to follow the format that you you all really, really seemed to like when we did our film study going position group by position group. So we'll start offense, then we'll go defense. And then to wrap up the show, we've got a little clip from Doug Mouton, his four takeaways that he does every week over at WWL TV. And we're going to have a little bit of a chat about the salary cap dropping over the course of the offseason, how that impacted the Saints and what it means for them moving forward next season. So let's start off with the quarterback spot. We got to see Taysom Hill come in as the starting quarterback up against the Dallas Cowboys. Uh, And we're going to talk about where he was at his best, where he was at his worst and what it means moving forward. So the place that I think that he was at his best is when they immediately put him in motion. He did take a sack in one of those or end up having to take a sack in one of those situations. But otherwise, in terms of him as a passer, five of seven in those situations. So let's define what that means. What we're talking about in that case is sort of these motion quarterback plays to where either he takes a snap and immediately runs a speed out to one side of the field, which effectively is a half field read. He's like looking at one key, making a decision based upon that. If it's not there, then he runs or sort of play action, boot action, naked action, those types of things to where you're getting outside of the pocket or you're moving the pocket with the offensive line. So I I think that that's really where he was at his best as a passer. Uh, His second pass, though, that he threw of the game was the one across the body trying to get back to the tight end. Probably should have been intercepted. A little bit of a turnover-worthy pass there. But outside of that, when you look at what he did in those moments, I thought that that's where he was at his best. And it goes to play action as well. He was 7 of 14, so 50%, and we'll explain why that's an improvement. 7 of 14 for 107 yards, a touchdown, and an interception with play action. Without play action, he was 12 of 27. So he went from being around 44% without play action to 50% with play action. So that's why I say that it was an improvement for him. Uh, Without play action, he threw for 157 yards and a touchdown, but also threw three interceptions without that play action there. It just gives you more time to take in what's happening around the field, and see, make those reads, make those decisions, just buys the quarterback a little bit more time. However, even when he was in play action plays versus when he wasn't in play action plays, he was given more than three seconds to pass in either one of those schemes. So something to keep in mind there, he's getting time to throw. And in some cases, he's creating time to throw. We saw him with a little bit more escapability than we usually see him with. So that gives you an idea of where he was at his best, where he wasn't at his best, and something to look to When you get to the New York Jets game this week, Sean Payton spoke with media this morning, Wednesday morning, mentioning that he's going to get another chance and he thinks he's going to do well. And I mean, that absolutely makes sense. So we'll see him. It looks like up against the New York Jets, maybe a little bit more play action. Uh, They only ran uh, five RPO plays with him over the course of this season. So I think that maybe you only can really identify maybe two or three in this game. Do you see more of that Next, do you see more of those speed outs, the immediate motion, the things where you could tell that Taysom was very, very comfortable creating some distance between himself and some of the oncoming pass rush? So we'll see what New Orleans is able to do with Taysom Hill going up against New York now that you get an idea of where he performed at his best. How do they immediately put him and give him the opportunity to utilize what it is that makes him special 
as a runner. The offensive line played well. It's just the interior gave up 10 pressures. 10 pressures given up just between Cesar Ruiz as well as Calvin Throckmorton. Very hard to play quarterback when you're getting pressure immediately up the middle like that. So something that you definitely want to see shore up moving into this game up against the uh, New York Jets. Do not allow this to turn into a Sheldon Rankin's revenge game up the middle. Um, If you go from the offensive line, the other thing, or as we continue with the offensive line, the other thing that was really interesting was that you saw a lot of sort of double teams in the middle. The Saints really focused on outnumbering, and this is not out of the ordinary, right? This is the idea of pass blocking. You want to outnumber, whether it's on one side of the field, the other side of the field, or as a whole, you want to have three hats on two hats, four hats on three hats. You want to outnumber the number of pass rushers, the number of defensive linemen in certain schemes, right? And so for this, the Saints did a lot of extra blockers. They used a lot of tight ends. They used a lot of both Mark Ingram and um, Ty Montgomery, who we'll talk about in a moment, used them as blockers. And they actually felt pretty comfortable in a couple of circumstances, putting a tight end and a running back on an, uh, on an edge rusher as opposed to an offensive lineman on an edge rusher. Now, they never did that with Demarcus Lawrence, of course, but you saw that with some of those depth players that had to come in and that were rotating with all the injuries along the defensive line for Dallas while double teaming in the interior. So they were trying to help out the interior, which still gave up a ton of pressure up the middle. So something to watch for next week. If you get both of those tackles back, do you continue to see these double teams in the middle to help out those interior offensive linemen? And does that end up freeing up more tight ends for passing uh, you know, attempts, more um, running backs for passing attempts, things like that, because otherwise those guys are being utilized in pass blocking a little bit more than you're used to seeing. I think the Saints might have a new tight end one in Nick Vanette, even if Adam Trotman is able to come back at a later point this season, which is possible depending upon how his recovery from his surgery goes. But Nick Vanette looks like a good blocker. Yes, he had the big holding penalty to bring back the 20 plus yard run by Mark Ingram, but he also turned around on that same drive and put together a big screen play for, you know, a, a big chunk of yards as well. Um, Taysom seems pretty comfortable with him, put a couple of passes right on him, and he's serving as a pretty good blocker. So something to keep an eye out on is the involvement of Nick Vanette, as well as the involvement of Jawan Johnson, who was open on a couple of plays, but wasn't found because the motion of the offense took the play the opposite way. That is a downside to where sort of this idea of moving the pocket and moving the quarterback immediately off the snap comes in is that you could run away from open players that get left open on the backside, but then you don't want to throw across the field and across your body. But you did see the big completion to Juwan Johnson up the seam where Juwan Johnson got hurt, but was luckily able to come back into the game. So something to watch there in terms of how the Saints continue to develop when it comes to the tight end spot. And when it comes to the running backs, you saw a good portion of uh, Mark Ingram and Ty Montgomery in this one being used as blockers. The run game was really through Taysom Hill. You averaged only 2.8 yards per carry with Mark Ingram and only 28 yards. You had about 5.3 yards per carry when it came to Ty Montgomery, but you know you only had 21 yards on four carries, so it's easy to get there right off of a small sample size like that. And so for the most part, their contributions came as very, very good pass blockers. They were actually two of the four highest graded pass blockers for the Saints this week. And finally, a little takeaway here for you for the wide receivers as we wrap up over on the offensive side. Kenny Stills, who of course was waived this week, was your lowest graded uh, wide receiver, of course, in terms of migrating and looking at what what he did. Um, 1.2 yards of average separation, according to Next Gen Stats on this one, lowest in the NFL for week 13. He was targeted five times. You had Traquan Smith with only 1.8 yards per target, but excuse me, 1.8 yards of separation per play, but was targeted seven times. And you saw some moments where he really did create some separation, particularly in the crossing routes. Taysom just has to get a little bit better in terms of anticipation. Throwing where a player is going as opposed to where a player is, is going to be a big part of what he needs to continue to work on. And we've seen before. And yes, he had the finger injury, but you can see the intent of where the ball placement is. And that's what you want to see improve. That's all. Just put the ball where they're going, not where they are when you're throwing. It's a nice little rhyme there. Uh, And you also had Deontay Harris and Ty Montgomery, who averaged 4.3 yards of separation per play. So that was really, really solid for them. Uh, Targeted eight and seven times, respectively. If you want an example of what it means to put a ball where a player is going as opposed to where a player is, look at the big Deontay Harris catch and run. Taysom Hill, fantastic ball placement on that throw, and it turned into a big 70-yard touchdown. Now, they're not all going to turn into 70-yard touchdowns, but if you put the ball in the right placement like that, catch a player in stride and a receiver crossing the field, you do create opportunities for yards after catch, which is where this team over the past four years has been extremely successful 
but have not been as successful this season. All right, y'all, that's the offense. We're going to get to the defense here and what this New Orleans Saints defense did to limit the NFL's top offense on Thursday. We're going to talk all through that as we continue on with our Film Watch Wednesday episode here on Locked on Saints. But first, I want to tell you about our friends over at On Location, Super Bowl 56 at SoFi in Los Angeles, less than 100 days away. And On Location, which is the official hospitality partner of the NFL, is the only place to score a once-in-a-lifetime Super Bowl ticket and experience package. I've gone on the website. I've looked at some of the stuff that they offer. It's absolutely incredible. You get to select your own seat, so you're not just plucked into some like nosebleed seat or something like that. You get to pick where you're sitting, which is awesome. You also get to choose from a bunch of different elite experiences featuring an exclusive pregame celebration with NFL legends. You can also get five-star LA hotels, live it up and never go hungry when you're out of town because this one, you're going to get some food from the great Wolfgang Puck. It doesn't get any better than that. So go and visit onlocationexp.com slash SB. Five six for more information or search Super Bowl on a location in your favorite search device. That's on location exp.com slash SB56 or search Super Bowl on location for more information. And of course, we have our friends over at betonline.ag, the New Orleans Saints opening up this one as six point favorites on the road going up against the New York Jets. So the Saints coming off of a five game win streak, but still able to be six point favorites going up against the New York Jets. Tells you a little bit about where the New York Jets are uh, for sure. So if you're feeling good about that line, if you're not feeling very good about that line, you want to get on it while it's still wide open like this, head over to betonline.ag right now and place your bets. Get in on that action. If you don't want to bet on your favorite team, can't blame you. You can check out the rest of the NFL, the NBA, the NHL, MMA, UFC, a whole bunch that you can get on, get in on and your favorite Vegas casino games as well. So go and check them out. Amazing stuff available for the rest of the 2021 season as we inch closer and closer to 2022. Now, as you get there, if this is your first time and you are a first time uh, participant over at betonline.ag, make sure you use the promo code locked on L O C K E D O N for a 50% bonus on your first deposit. They give you that 50% welcome bonus with the promo code locked on over at betonline.ag where the game starts. All right, Houdat Nation, once again, thank you so much for making us your first listen of the day here on Locked on Saints. Very, very much appreciate all of you. We're here talking through our Film Watch Wednesday. We went through the offensive side. Now let's talk a little bit about the defense. We'll go defensive line, linebackers, and then we'll get to the secondary here. And this was a special performance by this New Orleans Saints defense. Before we break it down, sort of position group by position group, I want to highlight for you what it is that the Saints were able to achieve in this game over on the defensive side. So we know that the Dallas Cowboys are the number one offense in the NFL in terms of yardage, uh, and the Saints were able to hold them as well as they did, and they held them to only 20 points. They did all of that. But let's get a little bit more into the nitty gritty here. There's a great stat that allows you to really break down how efficient an offense is. And we're not just talking like EPA or DVOA, things like that, that are like efficiency metrics. But this one is a little bit more to where it, it adjusts yardage based upon negative yardage that actually is gained by an offense with sacks and, and, and you know, interceptions versus attempts, things like that. A lot factors into this, but it's net yards per play. And we're also going to take a look at net yards per passing attempt, which kind of helps us focus in on Dak Prescott a little bit. The Dallas Cowboys were in the top five, number five in the NFL coming into this game as, you know, in terms of. Uh, net yards per play. So every play, what did they gain and how much yardage they lost in sacks, things like that. And then you also can look at this game individually where they were 15th. So the Saints dropped them big time in that metric, which is a big time efficiency metric. You can look at it again, a little bit more kind of in depth or a little bit more focused in on the quarterback net yards per play or net yards per passing attempt. And that's where we could take a look at Dak Prescott, who was sixth in the NFL and then dropped to 24th in the NFL for week 13. So the New Orleans Saints did a fantastic job limiting the Dallas Cowboys team as a whole and Dak Prescott specifically as a quarterback. Let's talk about how they did it. So the way that they did it with the defensive line was by creating a good amount of pressure, 16 pressures in this game that I was able to count. And they did it with a couple of creative ways. They were able to generate some twists. They were able to use some stunts, some pinch twists, and they do a really, really fantastic job with generating pressure from the second level as well. So this combination of Demario Davis rushing from the second level, he usually lines up if there's a three-man front, 
he'll kind of line up in the B gap in between the guard and the tackle and then swing his way around as David Onyemata crashes in. So the two will effectively switch places and then it allows Mario Davis these fantastic moments where he gets the blitz directly up the middle and get in the face of the quarterback. We saw that a couple of times in this game. We've seen it a few times over the course of the season as well. Uh, Carl Granderson had another good showing as well. We've talked about how well he's performed with the increased snaps that he's seen with all of the injuries on the defensive line in the last few games. You saw him put up four pressures in this one, including uh, a hit as well as three hurries. Didn't get a sack in this one, but still he affected some of these plays. And you also saw him pretty active in the run game as well. Now, you saw eight different defensive linemen with 20 plus snaps in this game. So we know how much the Saints love to rotate the defensive line. With all of the injuries along the D-line, there's a lot of concern that they wouldn't be able to do that and keep these players fresh. Thankfully, it looks like they have actually found a way to be able to do that. So a lot of action for these defensive linemen. However, here's where things got a little bit kind of shaky for the Saints defensive line. The Saints defense as a whole is credited with six missed tackles in this game. And that's me counting missed tackles in which a, a defender engaged with a player but wasn't able to bring them down. Not players that were in position, but then weren't able to make the tackle. So you think about like Malcolm Jenkins kind of getting broken down a little bit by CeeDee Lamb. Not a missed tackle on that situation, but more so getting hands on someone and then not being able to bring them down. Four of those six missed tackles came at the defensive line, which allows players to get into the second level, potentially even into the third level, depending upon where that tackle is missed, right? Is it on the outside? Is it on the inside? Is it in the box? Is it, you know, in an outside zone? Things like that, a la uh, Tony Pollard, right? You saw Carl Granderson in position to be able to maybe make a play there, but wasn't able to get him in the backfield. And all of a sudden, he's 58 yards down the field with Marcus Williams kind of watching them go. Um, So that's maybe where the defensive line came up short, but you did like the performance from the defensive line here, especially considering the injury riddled nature of the defensive line, which could potentially have some more issues going into this Jets game. Cam Jordan may not be available for this one, very unlikely to be available for this one, I would say, because he's on that COVID reserve list, needs two negative tests, 24 hours apart, all of that in order to be able to qualify to play. Hopefully, Marcus Davenport is healthy. We'll get our first look at the Saints injury report later on today. And a really interesting opportunity here to see Carl Granderson and uh, Marcus Davenport be able to rush with one another. Remember, Marcus Davenport, over the last three games that he played, four sacks and about 10 pressures in that. So pretty good stuff, and you'd, you'd like to get them back. Okay, let's go to the second level of the defense here. Linebackers absolutely all over the field. So Demario Davis, Quan Alexander, Pete Werner, and Zach Bond. Zach Bond was in for a lot of base snaps, three linebacker, uh, three linebacker sets, if you will. And then Pete Werner kind of rotated in for Quan Alexander on some obvious rushing downs and rushing situations. However, Quan Alexander had a phenomenal, phenomenal day. Had, I counted seven tackles that were either made behind the line of scrimmage or less than three yards from the line of scrimmage, which would be considered defensive stops. So he looked absolutely phenomenal in that range. No linebacker in this game allowed more than seven yards passing. Locked down the middle of the field close in the short and intermediate area. They did a really, really good job there. Quan had a phenomenal day. Quan Alexander was targeted three times, allowed only two catches for six yards, which includes 11 yards after catch. So some of those passes were behind the line of scrimmage, only a four yard long in terms of what actually qualified. 70.1 70.1 passer rating when targeted in this one. And he averaged snaps or played snaps, excuse me, on the defensive line, in the box, in the slot, as well as a couple of snaps out wide. The guy was literally all over the field. Phenomenal game by Quan Alexander. Demario Davis had a very good game as well, but Quan was just a standout in this one. Dare I say, a legendary performance by Quan Alexander. Uh, let's take a look at the secondary here. Just a couple of notes on this one. You had three different players in the secondary contributing as pass rushers, two from the slot and Bradley Roby and PJ Williams. And then you also had Malcolm Jenkins coming from the safety box position there. Uh, PJ Williams credited with a sack. We knew that they were going to try some new things and try some different things from the secondary and from the second level to try to generate some pressure with the injuries on the defensive line. We certainly saw that with these three players contributing as pass rushers at least once in this game. Uh, You also saw a great game from Marshawn Lattimore. What a bounce back game for him. Yes, he allowed six catches on 10 targets for 50 yards, which feels like a lot, but kind of have to contextualize it. Long of 17, only seven yards after catch allowed. Also had two pass breakups as well as an interception and a 33.3 pass rating when targeted in this game. Big time bounce back game for Marshawn Lattimore. And I know that we're all going to talk about Marcus Williams and the weird sort of 58-yard run and Soli Pollard, the way that he played that, trying to protect the cutback instead of using 
the sideline to get Tony Pollard out of bounds. Um, I know that that's what everybody's going to talk about, but he still played a phenomenal game. He continues to take away deep developing stuff. He also put a, a fantastic hit on Tony Pollard earlier on in the game where he was calling out some coverages on the outside and then ended up taking Tony Pollard, who kind of came behind two receivers from in line and was able to make a tackle on him basically at the line of scrimmage. Just a fantastic idea of rec- or opportunity uh, of recognizing what was happening watching it develop in front of you and then reacting and then getting that play uh, before it even had the opportunity to develop. Uh, And a lot of rolling coverages for the Saints in this one, starting off in middle of the field, closed or like a cover one with a single high safety over the top effectively, and then rolling into middle of the field, open coverages to where the middle of the field is left open and then you have safeties on either side. So cover two, cover four, things like that. So cover two being two deep safeties, cover four being four deep defenders, each taking like a quarter of the field as opposed to two safeties taking a half of the field. So they did a lot of rolling stuff, which worked to kind of stall that Dallas defense a little bit, but it also created opportunities for them. The big pass to where Dak missed CeeDee Lamb through to the inside, even though CeeDee's momentum was carrying or leverage was carrying him to the inside. A lot of that had to do with the pressure coming from Malcolm Jenkins. Had Dak had no pressure on him, he would have been able to see where that ball should have been thrown and where CeeDee Lamb's leverage was. But that happened because the safeties were rotating into a closed middle of the field look from a pre-snap middle of the field open look. So some of those rolling things where you're changing from one look to another post-snap can get you in trouble, but for the most part worked out well for the Saints paired with the pressure that they were able to create, which wasn't egregious, right? It wasn't an egregious amount of pressure, but it was the appropriate amount on a lot of different plays and a lot of different opportunities. So lots of good stuff that you saw from the defense. Some things you want to see improve on both sides of the ball. We'll be looking for that up against the New York Jets. But now I want to take a little bit of a look at the long term here. We've got a great feature here from Doug Mouton from WWL TV to talk a little bit about the salary cap, how it's impacted the Saints this season. And then we're going to talk a little bit about how it impacts them going into next season. Very excited to share this with you. Great, great, great stuff to take away and bring to your friends and talk a little bit about lots of good stuff coming up. So we'll wrap up the show here in just a moment with that as we continue on with today's episode of Locked on Saints. But first, of course, our friends over at Built.com, I want to tell you about them because they're my favorite protein bars in the world, protein bars that taste like candy bars. You can have your holiday desserts and everything and then kind of balance them out a little bit with that lovely built bar deliciousness and everything. Fantastic pair. I even recommend taking maybe one of the salted caramel built bars, dipping them into some hot chocolate, get a little bit of the flavor crossover between the both of them. Really, really good stuff. Anyway, now that you're hearing about my eating habits, let's talk about how built bar fits into yours. You're talking about fantastic flavors all over the place, including some limited edition flavors as well. Like the, uh, you got some built puff bars that are out there. You're talking about 17, 18 grams of protein, but only five or six grams of sugar in there as well. And some people are very passionate about their favorite flavors of built bar. So what's your favorite flavor? Mine is definitely mint brownie. Some folks really love peanut butter brownie, salted caramel cookies and cream. They love some of the fruit and chocolate combinations as well. Because don't forget, these are protein bars, but they are covered in 100% chocolate as well without spiking that sugar intake at the top of it. These things are unbeatable. Go and check them out at built.com. And don't forget to use the promo code LOCKED15, L-O-C-K-E-D-1-5, so you can get 15% off. That's at built.com. Let's get it. Houdat Nation, wrapping up today's episode of Locked on Saints with our WWL Wednesday segment, but doing something a little bit different because Doug... Mouton, sports director over at WWL TV, does four takeaways pretty much before and after every game. And he had a phenomenal one after the Thanksgiving game uh, up against the, the loss against the Buffalo Bills that I want to share with you. And it's timeless. I mean, in terms of what this piece actually represents for the New Orleans Saints, because it has impacted their entire season so far. So here's what Doug Mouton had to say about how the New Orleans Saints 2021 season has been impacted by the drop in salary cap thanks to a global pandemic during that 2021 offseason. And then we're going to talk about what it means for them moving forward. The Saints couldn't afford to keep Emmanuel Sanders or Jared Cook or Latavius Murray or Sheldon Rankins or Malcolm Brown or Janoris Jenkins and their replacements, while cheaper, are just not as good. So when the Saints lost their elite pieces, the drop-off was huge. And here's what happened. Back in 2014, the NFL salary cap was $133 million. Then in 2015, it went up to 143. That's 7.7% up. Then in 2016, 
16, the salary cap went up another 12 million, which is 8.4%. Then in 17, it went up 7.5%. So as you're making your budget for next year, you're following the trend. And the last three years, up 6.1%, then up 6.2%, then up 5.3%. So as you're budgeting for 2021, it makes sense to assume the salary cap would go up somewhere in there, in that 5 to 6% range. But then this happened, and the NFL's revenue took a pretty substantial hit, and the salary cap actually went down almost 8%. So that from 5% up to 8% down, that's like a 13 to 14% budgetary flip. And the Saints have always had a relationship with the salary cap sort of like this, where that guy represents the Saints. And by the way, that is the most French shirt of all time. And the tightrope is the salary cap and the Eiffel Tower. Well, that's still the Eiffel Tower. Now, some teams did spend big in free agency. This year and it paid off in Cincinnati and in New England, but the Saints had the best record in the NFL over the last four seasons by doing this. And the 13% flip killed them. For now, it defines the current losing streak and the middle part of this season. But the hope is get these pieces back on offense and change that script. Fantastic stuff from Doug Mouton there. And yes, that is the most French shirt I've ever seen. In honor of it, I wore a slightly French shirt, the most French shirt that I own. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about this because this is really, really good stuff in terms of essentially having that 13% swing from 2020 into 2021 uh, with that big drop in the salary cap in terms of what you're usually expecting to move up and instead having to move down. So let's talk about what this means right now, right? We'll start with the, the here and now. He mentioned a, a couple of players, replacing Jared Cook, Emmanuel Sanders, Latavius Murray, Sheldon Rankins, Norris Jenkins, and Malcolm Brown. Who do they replace those players with, right? Because Doug is, is spot on in his take here. Jared take effectively uh, uh, replaced with Nick Vanette. I mentioned earlier, Nick Vanette might be the new tight end one moving forward for the rest of the season, even if Adam Troutman comes back. But is he producing the same way that Jared Cook did? Not necessarily. And of course, he was injured for most of the season. Emmanuel Sanders effectively being replaced by Marquez Calloway, I guess you can say, or you could say, uh, you know, Traquan Smith, but neither of them producing at the level that uh, Emmanuel Sanders was, where Emmanuel Sanders finished the season with 61 catches. Right now, your best wide receiver is Deontay Harris with 31 catches, and now he's suspended for the next three games. Latavius Murray replaced him almost I mean, almost to his face with Tony Jones Jr., and that did not work out. Uh, but then they ended up trading for Mark Ingram. Mark Ingram's giving you a little bit more than Tony Jones Jr. has. There's no argument about that. But is he giving you what Latavius Murray gave you as a pass protector, as well as a pass catcher and as a runner? Not to the extent possible, right? Um, Sheldon Rankins effectively replaced in terms of snaps at three tech by uh, and, and by three tech, I mean the defensive lineman that lines up further outside. They're usually lined up a little bit offset. One is in the A gap or the, the section between the center and the guard. The other is usually in the B gap, which lines up between the guard and the tackle. So the one that's moved a little bit further on the outside. Sheldon Rankin's effectively replaced there by Shy Tuttle and Christian Ringo. Christian Ringo's had some really nice moments this season. Shy Tuttle has you know been, been there and had some pretty nice moments himself, but they have not been performing up to the level of like a top Sheldon Rankin season. Janoris Jenkins effectively replaced with Paul Sinadibo, rookie cornerback. You know we have a lot of faith in Paul Sinadibo here, but has he given you Janoris Jenkins level production? Not necessarily. And then Malcolm Brown, um, Shy Tuttle, and Malcolm Roach that line up like directly over the center in those like odd fronts of three or five down linemen. And again, you're not really getting the same production that you got from Malcolm Brown, who was traded away to the Jacksonville Jaguars to save some cap space. And I'll throw in Trey Hendrickson here. I mean, the Saints to me chose. Marcus Williams over Trey Hendrickson. And in doing that, Trey Hendrickson has effectively been replaced by Marcus Davenport, Peyton Turner, and Tano Passanio, all of which have had health concerns and haven't been able to be on the field very much this season. So what does this all mean for the Saints moving forward? Well, moving forward into the 2022 offseason, the Saints have to spend the rest of this season really getting a look at what the middle of their roster is and how they can improve it. And then they'll have to sort of do this kind of cost analysis around all of this because let's take a look at the salary cap going into 2022. So from 2021 to 2022, we know that the salary cap is expected right now to rise to $208.2 million. So that's a 14.1% rise for the salary cap across the NFL from 2021 to 2022. 
But remember that the salary cap has gone up every season. We started, uh, Doug Mouton started his counter from what, 2013 to 2014. So when you look back at that, and then you realize that the salary cap dropped coming into this season, you kind of have to look at what the increase is from 2020 through 2022 in order to really reconnect where you were planning on the salary cap to go. And from 2020 to 2022, you're only going to see a 5% increase. So that's a big deal to go from one space to down effectively 13% because of where you expected to go, but you certainly saw a, about a 5% drop or a little almost a 6% drop going into 2021, and then you're really only increasing 5% from where you originally were. So you're not seeing a huge boost in terms of what all of the planning you've done over the course of the last four seasons was supposed to allow you to do. So the Saints right now, $60 million over 2022 salary cap. A couple of restructures, like they can get under that number without cutting anybody, right? Restructures, things like that, adjusting things. But you have to get far enough under that you can also add players, replace players, things like that. So the middle of the roster is going to be something to really watch here. Teron Armstead is going to be somebody to watch, of course. There's going to be like these big name players that are that are worth watching over the course of this offseason. But the middle of the roster is going to be a really interesting one because when you have players that are set to leave, is it... Is it more cost effective to bring back and maybe pay a little bit extra for somebody that knows your system, a la what the Saints have been doing with PJ Williams over the past couple of seasons? Or do you bring somebody in that's not as familiar with your system, but has the traits and can fit into your system on a vet minimum contract for a new first year deal, which could be a little bit cheaper? Those are the types of analysis and and many, many more, right? But genuinely, there's absolutely no team that I trust more to figure this out than the New Orleans Saints, especially when it comes to questions of salary cap. But it's going to be very entertaining uh, to watch for a couple of different reasons. A, we're going to be able to talk about it here every day on Locked on Saints. And B, we're going to be able to watch everyone else around the NFL go how they do that because nobody understands how the New Orleans Saints navigate the salary cap and nobody understands the salary cap better than Mickey Loomis, Kai Harley, and the New Orleans Saints. All right, y'all, tomorrow is crossover Thursday. We're going to be joined by John Butchko of Locked On Jets to break down this New Orleans Saints and New York Jets game. What do the Saints have to do to get a win and break this five-game losing streak on the road? We'll talk about it and we'll break it all down with a very comprehensive preview on tomorrow's crossover Thursday. Thanks as always for making Locked on Saints your first listen of the day. For your second listen, make sure you go and check out Locked on Bets. Win yourself some money this weekend with your boy Q and handicapping expert Lee Sterling. As always, y'all, for everything you need about the New Orleans Saints, around the New Orleans Saints, your favorite team, make sure you follow me on Twitter at Ross Jackson, N-O-L-A. Hit me up. Let me know how the family's doing. Let me know how you're living. Let me know how your mom and them. And trust you, that nation, I'll holla at you.